I want to tell you all what I have learned about this new Axis DC16 Mackie console. I've used and mixed lots of different kinds of music in front of small groups and really large groups. And I have to tell you, this is the most exciting mixing board I have ever sat in front of. I've sat in front of much larger ones that have way more inputs and way more features. When it comes to mixing music on this thing, all I can tell you is that it's, in, it's incredibly musical. And the stunning amount of information that is available at any given moment is crazy cool. So let's get started. I am just going to run through a live multi-track recording I did of this band. And uh, I'm going to run through. I have all the levels. There's no compression, no gating, no process. There, there, it's nothing. It's bare bones tracks uh, right off the DL32R from a job I did a few months back. Oh, it's probably been five, five or six months back. And uh, I'm just going to go through and start mixing it. So let's get started. This center iPad is iPad A. This one is B. That one is C. All of these iPads can be configured to display and behave exactly how you want them. And here's how. You hit the gear setting on this. You tell the iPad which do you want it to be, A, B, or C. And I want this one to be A. There is one menu here, and it says current selected channel. So whatever you select, that's what it's going to show. First history, fixed view, that's where it, it stays exactly where you put it until you change it. Or the advanced, that's for me. Just kidding. The advanced gives you these options at the bottom that you can change. Let's look at the first one. Follow selected channel current selected channel. So, do you want this to follow the selected channel? If I select the guitar channel, for instance, will it select it? Yes, if I have current selected channel chosen. If I have do not follow selected, then I, when I hit the, the select button on the guitar or any channel, it won't change. I'm not going to waste our time with going over all of these, except they're very similar, and you can change these, and you set this iPad however you want it to act. Same way with that one. Same place. You go to the gear icon, and this is B, blah, 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 and this is C, blah, 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 blah. So what I have is I have this one set to be the main one. When I touch a fader, the faders are touch sensitive. So when you touch a fader, that's what's going to go. I just hit the guitar, okay? When I change the equalizer up here or on there, you see the change. As soon as I select a different channel, watch where this guitar goes. This guitar is going to pop over to that one. I'm going to hit the next channel over, which happens to be bass. Select. Now we're looking at the bass. But look over here, if you can see, now that changes that we made to the guitar are right there. Had we made some changes, we would see them. If it was a compressor, it would show the compressor and exactly where we changed it. It's so cool because when we just got done doing something and we've chosen to do something else, there's an indication of what we just did and we could say to ourselves, hmm, I kind of overdid that or maybe I didn't do it enough, whatever it was. And there it is right there. So that's why I have this one set to First history selected channel. In fact, you could do that one first. You could do this one second. So you have the most recent one there and the one before that there. It's awesome. So let's go start playing some music. What we have to do is this is the area we talked about in one of the earlier tutorials, the Master Fader 4.5 uh, tutorials. We didn't talk a lot about it, but this is where I'm controlling the multi-track playback from. It's a small hard drive. And 
we're going to play this, but before it's going to play into these channels, and it's only 16 tracks, before it does that, I have to change the inputs from the XLR input. And if you'll notice over here, the gain we talked about earlier, that's showing all the gain levels. But what we want to do is use the second input, the B input, reminiscent of the analog days when we had a mic line switch. This is the first channel. Let's look at the input. We're using input A. The source is A. It's mic preamp 1. Okay? If we select B, it's USB 1. So instead of going through and swiping every one of these all the way across, all you have to do is go over to the multi-track page and hit B right there. Boom. We hit play, get back out of there, and we're playing music. Okay? So now you see all the trims are showing. The gain, remember it's gain, but if you hold the alt button, it shows the trim. The trim is the adjustment when you're using a digital input, whether it's Dante or USB. I am going to select pan because I like to see the pan positioning while I'm mixing. All right, here we have kick, snare, hat, tom, floor, over, bass, guitar, sax, key left and right. The key left is brass, parts, key right is typically a piano sound. Rick, Lacey, Danny, and Billy. And then, of course, page over at the right, we have our two delay, or our two reverbs and delay our iPad for background music, break music, whatever. And there's our VCA for all monitors, and it should be up to zero, okay? Well, in fact, let's notice when I touch that, this changed. Isn't that wonderful? I love it. So let's put this up to zero dB. I want to be exactly right. So I'm going to tap up here, and I'm going to make it zero. Enter. There we go. I personally like to use the vintage version of the compressor. The modern version is much nicer for me when I use the gate. That's just what I like. So I'm going to hit the solo button here and we're going to hear the kick drum and let's do it. Oh, by the way, we've got all the channels muted, so let's unmute that. This is our all mute. Unmute that. We'll leave the two reverbs muted for now. Let's look at our view group. We're looking at front of house. That's good. All right. Solo, kick drum. Sounds pretty good right off the bat. Hmm. Did somebody already EQ this? <laughs> I'm using a Shure Beta 52A kick mic. The EQ is off. All right. Let's go down here and hit the EQ button. That's a graphic EQ. That's the wrong one. We want the four band parametric EQ. And there's the kick drum. And we can see over here on this iPad the view of the spectrum of the bass drum. And I am going to put a high pass filter on it. I can just turn that on and you can adjust it like we do always have done with the uh, iPad. Or we can do it right here. Here's EQ on and off. EQ is on now. Here's the high pass filter. On and off. Very convenient. And then we have our bands of EQ. So, I like, believe it or not, to put a little bit of high pass filter. I shouldn't say put a little bit of high pass. Re relieve some extreme low end of the kick drum from the subs. 35 on down is pretty, uh, really unmusical for a kick drum. Unless it's heavy metal, then you want all you can get. All right, so that's good. And I'm going to go to the second band of EQ right here. And I'm going to get rid of, see that stuff right there? Let's sweep the frequency to that. And we're going to boost it so we can hear it real easy. These are the kind of things you get to do in a sound check that you really can't do during the concert. Well, you can if you're real careful about it and quick. <laughs> so there's the frequency that I don't like. I'm going to make it real narrow, and now I'm going to go duck it a little bit. Listen to how amazing that kick sounds now compared to... That's, of course, obnoxious. That's too much. See, now we've lost too much of the 
character of the drum. We just wanted to get rid of a little bit of that. That's pretty cool. And the third band I would use for some mids and highs. Again, I'm boosting like crazy just to dial in and hear it really good. That's the frequency that I may want later. Probably not quite that wide. I'm going to turn it back down. Now, if I want to put this all the way back to, to flat real quick, all you have to do is hold the Alt and Shift button, move the gain knob just to skosh either way, and it takes it right back to flat. It already sounds bad right now. I was already used to hearing it with a little bit of uh, attack, so let's leave it right there for now. Okay, that's the kick. I'm not going to put uh, any compression on it, but I would like to put a gate on it. So let's go over here and hit the dynamics button. We can see here that the gate is off. Let's turn it on. And let me explain the settings of all of these widgets, sliders. I'm going to pause this. All right. Let's go back over here. A gate. Let me explain the gate. Just like a gate that you would have on a farm with a bunch of farm animals like cows and all that. Little cows, big cows. It's a crazy analogy, but I use it all the time. If the cow is big enough and it pushes against the gate, it has enough authority to open the gate. The threshold adjustment right there at the top is where we adjust how big a cow it, it has to be for the gate to open. In other words, if he hit the bass pedal or just barely bumped it, do we really want that? In jazz, yes. In pop music, probably not. We could get by with putting a gate on it. Sometimes you just cannot use a gate. It's too dangerous. You miss stuff. But on this song and stuff like this, it's great. So that's the threshold. Okay? And here's the knob for the threshold right there. There's a knob right there for it. And that adjusts how big the cow has to be. How loud does the kick drum have to be? I know I'm repeating myself. We set that so that when the drummer is not playing the bass drum, the mic is shut, the gate is closed. Okay? L the next thing down is the range. If you take and move this range up and down, you can see right there that when the gate shuts, it's not going to shut all the way. It's only going to close a little bit. The farther over you have the range right there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to close it all the way. If you listen to just the kick drum, you would hear absolutely no kick. It would be completely gated. So it's neat because you don't have to open and close a gate. A gate can be used to open and close partly. So you can lower the sound of the junk that's going on in the background while the drum is not being played, which is really cool. I kind of like doing that instead of closing it all the way off. So maybe somewhere just about right there. The attack is exactly that. How fast do you want this gate to respond? How fast do you want that gate to open when he hits the kick? If you have this slid all the way over to, oh, let's say 164 milliseconds, well, that's over a tenth of a second. The bass drum would probably be done already. At least half of it would have already happened, and the gate wouldn't have even opened. It would have opened way too late. We want the attack to be as fast as possible because this is a percussive sound. Next thing down is the hold. Once the gate opens, how long does the gate hold open before it begins to shut? We would want to adjust that hold time, and you can see when I move it, it moves up here in 183, that's 183.3 milliseconds. It shows in milliseconds. There are a thousand milliseconds in a second. Sorry if you already knew that. But that is how long the gate is going to stay open fully until it begins to shut. Once that amount of time has passed and he hasn't kicked the drum again, then it goes down into the release. Now, does it 
slam shut or does it fade down? So if it's a kick drum, the kick drum is going to go boom, boom, boom. A floor tom, for instance, doom. it's pretty long, almost a second long. So if it was a kick drum, we would want the release to be eh, pretty short. If it's a floor tom, we would want it to be considerably longer. So let's play this kick drum and let's tweak these settings and listen. Disregard the compressor at the bottom. Notice it's pulling down, but it's not pulling it all the way down. Let's close that range down, make that range go down even more. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the snare drum in the right channel as a reference right now, okay, just so we can hear it. Got to turn the solo off. Okay. Sounds pretty good, except I think it's holding a little bit too long. Let's listen. Again, some more, I, sorry. Uh, it's kind of chopping it off. Can you hear it? I'm going to turn the snare off. Actually, that's pretty good. Okay, but let's take the range. He was playing a lot of kick drums there. A lot of pedals. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. Move right along. Now, let's do something. Since we just took the time to make all those settings, for this bass drum, why don't we save that setting? We could, it might, work good on some other job. Let's go to presets and let's uh, hit store preset. What are we going to call it? We're going to call it kick. All right, return. All right, be quiet. That's the kick. Let's go to the snare drum next, okay? Here's the snare drum. Let's go back and play this. I'm not going to do anything to the snare drum. We could look at the EQ, though. Yeah, I would like to put a high-pass filter on it. We're not going to need anything low end from the snare drum so we can filter some of that out that'd be a good thing all right let's uh listen to the hi-hat god i got a lot of low mids and stuff in there let's get rid of that turn the high pass filter on i'm just listening Good. Now this is a tom, and it's probably going to be a little, it's going to be difficult for us to uh, sit here and wait for him to play the, that. So let's do this. I already know it's going to need, well here, maybe right here. Yep. Let's go back and hear that again. Dynamics. Turn the gate on. Let's see if we have a preset for toms. Four tom. Oh, I do. I have a tom preset. Let's see what it is. Let's move on to the floor tom. Definitely need some EQ on this. Every time the bass drum's beater hits the skin of the bass drum, the floor tom resonates. It constantly rumbles. High pass filter. Uh, we can look at the value up here. Oops.
We need a nice low end. It's a floor tom. I mean, it go down really low. So it depends on how they're tuned. Let's listen here, maybe. We get lucky. There we go. Pretty nice. So, here again, not much to do with EQ. But we do want to do a gate. We want to do a gate. Let's do a gate. Yeah, there we go. Let's turn the gate on. And let's see if we have a preset. That'd be nice if we did. Floor tom. We do have a floor tom preset. Let's hit yes. I think it's coming up here a little bit right here. Nope. Let's go back just a little bit. I just heard a little bit of it. A little snare drum that got there, leak in. Snare drum was loud enough. That's good. Let's look at that one more time and notice how long it takes for that. It goes boom. It's nice. It fades it down. It opens fast and fades it down. Listen. Here it comes. Nice. It could have actually released f faster. Let's play that one more time. Like, hey, drummer, would you do me a favor and hit that floor, Tom? <laughs> Pretty cool. Let's move on. Uh, let's do the overhead. Uh, let's do the overhead. Um, EQ again. High pass filter. Good enough. We don't need to boost the high end. It's a good, nice condenser mic. Good. Bass guitar. Let's listen to the bass guitar. This playing speaks for itself. And lots of mids, and that's a lot of bass players have lots of mids these days, but I'm going to tweak it the way I think it needs to sound. I have to respect his wishes for his sound, but he has no idea what his bass sounds like through my system, so I have to be the judge of that. Let's hit EQ. Let's turn the EQ on right there. There's some buzzing going on. Let's use band three. Let's find the frequency. There's that buzzing. Listen. It's like a buzzing. It's just part of the strings. So I can take some of that out. So that's it. So what we need to do now is we need to make it real narrow because it's a very small part of the neighborhood of sound that's buzzing. Now we go back to flat where it was. Now we know what it is. Now we can duck it. And we don't want to take it out, probably. Actually, we need to, we need to uh, make it a little bit wider, the bandwidth. Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. Frequency, band. Here we go. They're still buzzing. Are we on the wrong frequency? Yeah, I think we were a little bit too high. All right. Now let's put a high-pass filter on it. You're going, huh? Why would you put a high-pass filter on a bass guitar? Well, because if you ever look at a spectrum and look at what's going on on the bass with all the low frequencies. Lots of times, and not always, there's some really nasty, extremely low frequencies going on down there. Naturally, we're gonna have that sub, that uh, bass going through our subs. We don't want our subs making, blowing a bunch of junk that's not music. We want the notes. So let's see what frequency we wanna dip this at. This is showing 40 right here. It's nice. It shows it up there, of course. You can see it up there. But it also shows right there. I don't know if you can see that. It shows 60, whatever. I'm going to say about 35 on down. That'll certainly get his low B. Actually, just a little below 35 hertz. So that's a good 
EQ for the bass. I'm going to save this preset. Do we have one already? No. I'm going to call this store preset John K bass. Return. All right. Good. Now let's move on to the guitar. I'm going to go back to the beginning of this track because I haven't heard it enough times. <laughs> It's a nice sound of Sennheiser microphone made for guitar cabinets. It's an E906 or a 609, either one. They both do a great job. I think they're convenient because they're flat and they stay up against the grill. They don't move around a lot. And uh, this is a good player, he's got good equipment, so right off the bat until I have a need to, I'm not going to compress it and I'm certainly not going to put a gate on it. So I'm going to leave it alone. Let's move on to the sax. Oh. Wow. So let's go back a little bit and hear that again. Real shrill around 3K. Let's hit our EQ, it's already hit. Let's, uh, do we have a high pass on him? Let's put it on there. 90 hertz should be good enough. He's not gonna go bah. So, band three. Notice it's gray because our EQ is not turned on. Let's turn it on. Ooh, wrong frequency. 3K, somewhere around there. Let's get rid of that 3K. Ooh, wow, that hurts. Here's where it was. put too much of a dip in it. Man, I need to cut 3K on my own voice. It's killing me. I don't want to cut too much of it. I mean, it is supposed to sound like a saxophone. The sax, not me. All right, so uh, that's the sax. Now let's listen to the piano. Built-in reverb. Yeah, I was wrong. I should have taken a stereo out. At least it would be in stereo. But we can always put reverb on it. Make it stereo. That's good enough. And Rick's vocal. Good diction. Let's turn the EQ on. Heck, turn everything on. All right, let's set his 3K. 3K. Think I wanna dance. Uh. Gotcha, gotcha. Little girl when it's high filter. He's not going to go down to 80 hertz. Let's put him at 100. Well, we'll oh, 85 hertz. Oh, Gonza, Gonza, That's good. Woo! Ooh, let's go back and put uh. a compressor on that, because that was pretty hot. Uh. All right, let's go to his compressor. Let's go to Ooh. dynamics. Let's turn the compressor Gonza, on. Gonza. Oops, that's the gate, sorry. Compressor on. We want a fast attack. Little Release. Medium, not rain. fast. This singer's dynamic range is quite extreme. So I'll use a high ratio oh, setting, probably gotcha, 12 to gotcha, one. Gotcha. When he Woo! sings really loud, we wanted to pull a lot back. Uh. If we had a lower ratio, when he hits the threshold, it would pull back just a little bit. 
when he hits the same loud note, now it's going to pull back even more. Eight to one would be even more. Twenty to one is really aggressive. And then listen, I'll shut up. Listen to the two to one. Twenty to one. Look at how it's pulling him back. Too much. Still want him to have good dynamics, just not excessive. Now it's, he's singing so loud that we're losing gain, but that's okay. We need to increase the gain, this picture, which is now smaller, raise it back up so we can hear it. It's the gain. A lot of compressors call that makeup gain. Now the problem with too much compression is when he's not singing, if it's staying compressed, when he quits singing, it releases. And more often than not, that's when the monitor starts to feed back because of too much compression, which is not a good thing, but that did a good job. Now, if we didn't have a compressor on him, notice how much softer the background noise is when he's not singing. Oh, that, that hurt though. So notice that's pulling up all that junk in between. What we could do is we could have a much slower release. Let's do this. Let's put, uh, let's make a preset out of that. And let's call that Rick. Do we have a Rick? No, we don't. Still preset Rick. And notice how nice it is that we don't have to say Rick comp because we just saved this preset for that compressor, not the gate, not the channel, the preset for the compressor. In the interest of time, let's go to Lacey's voice, her channel, okay? There she is. And let's just paste Rick's uh, preset in there and see how it does. We'll know it when she starts singing. Let's turn the reverb on. Not the big ballad reverb, just the smaller reverb. And let's take a look over here at that reverb. One, there's the master, it's turned up. And uh, these are the levels that are going into it. Kick just a little bit, contrary to the fact that everyone else in the world, most people don't ever put kick drum in reverb. I think you should. If you ever listen to lots of recordings that sound really killer, there is a little bit of reverb on the kick. It should sound like it's in the same place as everything else. It shouldn't sound all by itself. Snare drum should have reverb. Yes, it does. Hi-hat, and yeah, it's too wishy-washy, other junk in the background. Toms should have some, and they're gated, so we can actually run those up kind of nice, but you don't need a lot of reverb on toms if they sound really good. Overhead, definitely not. Bass guitar, yeah, maybe a little bit. Guitar, mm, good amount. Sax, even more than anything else. And uh, brass parts from the keyboard, yes. Uh, key, right, the piano, eh, just a little bit. And then vocals, eh, it's good. And that's the send. Now, let's look at the second reverb, the ballad reverb. Uh, tom, floor, big floor tom, yeah, reverb. Bass, now, maybe just a skosh, but we have to be a little bit careful on this one because this is a ballad. We don't want those bass, the bass to go <laughs> all over the place. Uh, sax, uh, it's pretty good. Go back to our left and right mix, and now let's play so we can mix with some reverb. Ah, yes. Let's listen to what this uh, snare drum sounds like with just the reverb. We're gonna go to the snare drum channel, and we're gonna take it out of the mains. That's the main button right there. So that's the snare drum going to the reverb, but not to the mains. Now we're gonna. That sounds good. How about some hi-hat? How about some panning? To the right maybe a little bit. 
So if you look at the drummer, usually a right-handed drummer, his hi-hat's on our right. So I'm going to put it just a little bit, not to draw attention to it, just to give it some space. I'm going to pan the overhead just a little bit to the right. I mean to the left, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that later. Put these toms back up here. Too much hi-hat. All right, now let's keep going, bass. Okay, I'm gonna back up just a skosh here, and I wanna hear that floor tom again, and I want way more reverb on the floor tom. Ooh, that was too much. Here we go, coming up. Listen for the reverb on the floor here. It's still not enough. Go back and hear that again. All the way hard left and right. They don't even sound like they're part of the band. All right, and now let's add the piano. right there that Rick is singing and Lacey isn't. Yikes.
One, two, three, four. I just had the sax on and there it is. Anyway, the price of admission was right on the money. And so is this mixer by Maggie. Wasn't that corny? <laughs>